So don't be racist, will... don't spam. <laughs> yes. And I think... Uh, can you send a message on the chat? Yes. You should see it on the stream as well. There you go. So let's talk maybe a bit about this stream, give uh, everyone an introduction about what we're trying to do and so on. So my name is Omar. I'm a backend engineer programmer since I was a kid. Uh, as a job, a full-time job, I'm a backend engineer. And I've always been interested in kind of graphics programming and low level code, optimization, and specifically, really, games and game engines. And so this series is me going through the steps of creating a game engine, more or less, uh, 2D, 3D, we'll see, I guess, uh, in Golang. And so we'll go from completely scratch project like this one to hopefully loading graphics, potentially doing 3D lighting, um, animations, input, all of that. And all of this code will be open source. And then hopefully it's elaborate for people to to be able to use. And maybe Mohammed give an introduction as well. Uh, I'm so ready for this, but yeah, I'm also a backend engineer I'm working for a startup in Amsterdam. Um, I haven't, I don't have an interest specifically in, in game development, but I'm just here to learn and see how, or what this is all about, so. Yeah. yeah. I think that's why it's really exciting because, uh, now the title of this is, it's Noobs Building a Game Engine Go, and, and this is very accurate because while I am a bit more experienced in these things, I'm not really an expert. and. One of the goals of this is to just show very natural uh, progress of how things develop, of the uh, bugs people face, and so on. So it's not going to be uh, for super beginners in programming. You do need to know a bit about things like variables, loops, functions, whatnot. But anything above that will hopefully cover in this uh, in this series. So anything we go through, so we'll be discussing things like. OpenGL, uh, maybe a bit, a bit of Golang, and then you know how how games work, views work, and just go on building uh, what's a game engine, and and going once this game engine is somewhat developed, then we want to start using it to do things like simple games, and progress from there. So we want to use our own code things and this will give us an idea whether this is any good or not. Uh, I think um, Hamid here and maybe one other person um, is coming where they are completely fresh is going to help us also get the interesting questions uh, so we get the chance to explain them essentially. Okay so today is the first session I don't know what the schedule will be like we might do one every week, um, we'll see, yeah, let me, okay. so, um, so Mohammed, maybe as a, a completely fresh person on this, so do you have any, in general, like, questions about games, how they're made, um, potentially about GPUs, Um, so my understanding of the way games are made is that you have, uh, you have like the, <clears throat> let's say the, the scenes or the, like the maps where the, uh, like on the game is designed. So yeah, like you would do that in unity, you would design the, um, you know, uh, uh, the world where the game takes place. Yeah. And then you can also define the like the physics and the rules of 
like of the world, um, how certain things interact with each other, the physics, uh, maybe speed, weapons, other stuff. But then I don't know what happens after you have this kind of, uh, I think it's similar to how you do like videos in, in Adobe After Effects where you like first you put on, for example, some kind of 3D stuff going on or some some effects on the video and then you have to render it. So I guess Unity projects end up being rendered and then all this stuff is put in a like an like an executable and then you can run that game on your machine. But I think that's what I understand from from game development. Yeah, so it's like it is very similar. low understanding. Yeah. Yeah, but the so the, the difficult part is in games is it has to be real time. Like we're talking now people are, are talking about right sixty uh, FPS. I need to get my drawing board for this, but okay, sixty FPS, right? So your entire logic, your rendering process needs to happen sixty times a second. So you cannot pre render. Um, Blender or Adobe and these things, they can take hours to render and find and keep some super high quality thing. In a game, everything must be done super fast. And you only have, or a frame, so 60 frames a second. So one frame comes out to be around 16.6 milliseconds. That's all the time to, you have to do all your graphics and logic and AI and everything and physics. All of that has to run. Within this time frame, because it, if it takes longer, your FPS is going to go down, right? And to do this, uh, and the difference between this, I think, and normal program, right? Where we're just talking before the stream about how uh, this is really a gap to some extent that is not taught, that is not uh, used a lot, so. Almost everything covers web development, so you have your, uh, you know, your servers. Sorry for the handwriting, but your servers, and then you know, we have the your client, like the browser, right, the web browser, and every almost everything on the internet and taught in schools and whatnot covers these two only. <laughs> we don't do much more. The only thing really that's popular aside from these things um, is the CLI. Right, the command line, like let's say, thirty-five commands. Um, but this is pure software. The server is pure software, and the browser is HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. So you, um, and, and then the CLI is just text. There is very little graphics work, and I think um, we have so many people who have no idea if they want to do a graphical application. Maybe you want to do a simulation, a video game. You either use something like Unity or Unreal Engine, or you absolutely have no idea what to do, where to start. Well, maybe I don't want to use it. Maybe I have a high-performance simulation that I want to run. In that case, what do I do? I have the super powerful thing everyone is talking about called the GPU, and we have no idea how to use it. So in a way, what we are taught, and even YouTube and so on, is only doing one part of computers nowadays, is the CPU. That's all people know. So you have an, another CPU with different capabilities, different speed, different um, advantages and disadvantages that no one has, or like a lot of people have no idea how to interact with that. And this is one of the points that I want to cover here is to kind of do that. And I myself am not an expert, but this is why you know it's called moves doing it because it's it's a learning process. We want to go through it and show the steps and how someone would go um, uh, around doing that. And maybe also this can become a resource for people too. Um, I think Kamil is here, right? Oh, Kamil, you there? Hey guys, what's up? Hello, everyone can hear you on the stream. We're recording this to put on YouTube later. Uh, maybe you can give an introduction with yourself a little bit. Wait, you guys are, is this on Twitch? Yep. Right, it's so, what, so what's the plan? Right. So 
the idea is, you know, as we're talking here, um, we're going to build from scratch in Golang um, a game engine, more or less. And we want to look into, you know, how to do graphics in general. Like, we all know how to do CLI, we all know programming. But if I tell you do a graphical application, most people are lost here. If I want to do a simulation, if I want to show some 3D objects or 2D objects on the screen, no one has it like that. How do you interact with the GPU? Right? How do you make a game? What is OpenGL, uh, you know, Direct, DirectX, Vulkan, what are these things? Um, how do you use GPUs? You only know how to use CPUs. And what are game engines and games? So it all ties together because games are one of the most common uses, right? Most popular for uh, using the GPU. And we kind of want to go from scratch, assuming only basic programming knowledge, and we want to build a game engine that we ourselves like a library in Golan that can be used to then build games. So that can include uh, graphics, sound, inputs, um, physics, all of that. That is then exposed. Now, exactly how I'm not an expert, again, right? But that's also one of the points. It's maybe, I don't know, for now it's too early to say, but every week we're going to have a session and uh, just go through this from scratch. And I have already done a little bit, not a lot. Uh, and I can show you here. Let's, uh, let's check out to dev. And this is all open source. So if I run the code, <clears throat> so we have a window. Um, here we have what's called a shader. And we look into those as well. This is a rectangle made up out of two triangles being drawn. And there is communication between CPU and GPU to alternate the colors and whatnot. And you can see you know, what's the FPS. So I'm limiting it to around 120 FPS a second, and so on. And, and this is. You know, the basis, this is not a trivial amount of code. It's already a good amount, and we have a good amount to do shaders and whatnot. So the idea is, what does all of this mean? You know, how does it work? Because I think it's it's been a bit weird, where everyone just knows, OK, you know, CPU. Everyone knows a server. You know, what's an HTTP server, how to set one up. Um, how to code in JavaScript, like code for the browser, for the CLI, for example, it's just printing text. And so this world is kind of in the middle and almost no one knows what, but I think it's it's very useful. If you, if more people, if we have more tooling, that makes it a lot easier to do um, graphics programming in general. I wouldn't say just games. This is what most people think about when they think about um, Unity or Unreal, it's like, oh, it's for games. Like, no, we can do more. I can do uh, maybe a mathematical program. Maybe I can do that shows graphs, right? Maybe I can do a simulation, like Cyril Automata. I can do a, a machine learning or AI simulation with graphics and this kind of thing. What's so, going for? Um, one question that I have is basically like a game engine is an abstraction layer over the the GPU, uh, 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 or like the like the layer that synchronizes between the GPU and the CPU, so that it gives you like clean interfaces, so that you could easily create a I don't know a rectangle, and get a shader, and then you know yeah, uh, like I I get up and running faster. Not just GPU. So the game engine gives you uh, let's call it graphics. Sorry, this is very small. Let's go here. So um, game engine will give us graphics, abstractions for graphics, inputs, uh, resource loading. So we're talking you know, images, 3D models, sound file. Yeah. Right? Um, it usually, um, not necessarily, but gives us some UI to make all of this easy. And of course, uh, user interface tools. Like, how do I build the user interface? How do I make a button on my thing? So you have user interface, uh, physics, 
some kind of physics, 2D or 3D or both lighting. So Game Engine is huge. It's one of the biggest, most complex programs um, you can do if you want to really build it out. And that's why, you know, there isn't a billion of them, like really commercial ones, only a few, because it's really hard. So uh, physics, lighting, input, multi-platform support. So if I want to make my game once, and then I want to deploy it on Xbox, PlayStation, and mobiles maybe, and so on. So this is also very difficult. Uh, maybe, not not necessarily, but it's less so networking. If you want to do a multiplayer game. Uh, so yeah, so, so you need all of these. And uh, as we will see, doing even a small part of any one of them is a ton of work. And then making sure it's cross-platform is even more work. Um, and so the game engine hopefully takes care of most of this so you can work at a very high abstraction level and making a game is it becomes very easy. So instead of calling OpenGL or like talking directly with the GPU to do some graphics, I just call some very easy sorry, uh, high-level functions and that takes care of everything for me. I'm not sure if I forgot other things, but yeah, probably there's probably more uh, to do here. Mm. So, so these are all things you have to do. And here you have shaders, what not, debugging, logging. So it's it's a very oh, and and one of the it's not really a game engine thing, but one thing you have to keep in mind is performance. And <laughs> I think this we see now a lot of a lot of days nowadays. Just people just don't care. And even if you don't do games full time or graphics full time, it gives you an appreciation and understanding um, more about the computer, the CPU, the RAM, cache, all of that, and how to make code fast, really fast. Because here we're talking doing all of this in 16 milliseconds. A server wouldn't mind if it's responds to 100 milliseconds. Like, oh, yeah, it's fast. Like, <laughs> it's nothing. Here we are talking about doing a billion things. In. So it's uh, it's a different environment, different set of constraints. It can be very interesting. Uh, so yeah, and, that, and that's why usually people, they, there are definitely in Python and whatnot, but you cannot do something major in a slow language just because you have so many requirements. And there is a good bit of math, by the way. Math. Algebra and whatnot, but with the component. Do you have questions on this? Yeah, I think it's uh, it's clearer now because I didn't like I know that you know they have an engine, but what does it do? Like yeah, like what uh, like what does it give you? This makes it a bit clearer. Yeah, and, and this is what you know I want to go through. Um, if I want to. I don't want to make a game, maybe. I just want to do some program that has a window and easily do graphics through it. Now, you can use some, there are libraries on this one that there aren't, but um, sometimes you want a bit more high level that you can do. And, and I think this becoming more popular, the availability of more tools that allow you to do this, uh, making them easier, while not completely you know, abstracting away everything to the point people don't understand what's happening is, is much needed. I believe we would see a lot more GUI programs if GUI was just a bit easier. Now you might, you know, fight and you might need to know about graphics and everything. So almost no one, no one covers this. Everyone is like, okay, here's a loop, here's this class and so on. Here yeah, it's, it's a different ball game. And it's hopefully you know what we want to kill. Okay. Do we have a scope or? Um, not yet, but at the very least, definitely. We have, uh, how do I do a tick mark? But, uh, you can do like a, like an array thing and then emoji. Yeah. What do you mean? This. And so, but yeah, let's let's do any more use. Let's do uh, yeah, with this. Right. Uh, sorry, like like on Mac you can have an emoji keyboard. Yeah, it's this uh, one. Actually, on it's, it's yeah. Basically, okay. 
So graphics for sure, resource loading for sure. Now it doesn't mean we support everything under the sun. And maybe some things. So handmade here, all right. We did a full CH in C, nothing go like in C. He did absolutely everything from scratch. No libraries. For us, we'll probably use libraries for some things. You don't have to parse and know about every single model, but we'll do some of that. So how to load resources. UN interface, probably. I mean, OpenGL does give you some stuff there. Um, physics, that, lighting, maybe. For sure, basic lighting, but uh, anything else. Multi-platform, probably not, but I mean, we're using Golang and OpenGL, so hopefully that will be easy-ish. Networking, no. Performance, yeah, we'll look at that. Word math, we'll do a library there. So, so we want to have a proper, like this open source, right? And as we progress, as we implement more and more things, I want to, I want us to kind of make games. So we're going to use our own library to develop things. And maybe the more advanced it becomes and the deeper our knowledge of kind of these things goes, we can make maybe more complex uh, projects. <clears throat> uh, so I think for a start, I, I want to cover the, talk about the really fundamental things. What the hell, Cringy Hell. Uh, you know, a bit about the GPU. Because everything going forward for a while is going to be is OpenGL, what's OpenGL, interacting with it. Uh, I want to talk about um, double buffers, either. For example, like one top is double, double buffering, or, or maybe it's called a back buffer. Right. It's a back buffer, and then uh, you know, RGBA or pixels, how they're structured, etc. So some fundamental concepts. Oh, of course, for um, drawing on the GPU, we do everything in triangles to vertices um, and then vertex attributes. And whatnot. So you use vertices to build triangles, right? There's so vertices become on the GPU triangles, which can then give us polygons. So even on the computer, even a circle or a sphere is made up at triangles. Uh, and the GPU is extremely fast at, at trying triangles. So you can have like millions of them. Right. And this is one of the, I think we'll see like one of the main differences and why we might write some really long code, OpenGL code just to develop on the GPU. Um, but we'll see a huge performance difference. We're talking maybe tens, hundreds of times the performance. The CPU can barely just fill a screen with a static color. It's already it already starts to struggle, especially at higher resolutions. GPU is just like does that and billion things more. Because it might not seem obvious at first, but if you are running at 1080p, right? So that's 1920 pixels by 1080 pixels. So that's how much. That's uh, that's already uh, above a million, right? Or around two million pixels. Two million pixels. Now, each pixel will have RGB potentially A. So you so the CPU, if it just has to fill colors, right? It has to loop a few million times, and then each time set three to four colors, right? like three to four bytes. This, because it's a, like, that's one of the main differences. CPU is a serial. It goes like one instruction to the next to the next. It's, it's extremely slow, extremely slow. GPU, on the other hand, has like, you can imagine hundreds or thousands of small, weaker, more specialized CPUs or cores, you can imagine. So if, if a CPU has, four cores, 10 cores, GPU is like a hundred, a few thousand. And then each one of these cores can do a few pixels all in parallel. So what takes a CPU ages to do, GPU does in seconds, not seconds, like milli or, or microseconds. 
Um, and this is also why it's used a lot nowadays for machine learning, AI, and whatnot, simulations, because it's just extremely fast. It's because any operation that can be parallelized um, can be run. The GPU is extremely quick. This can apply to other domains, especially in web development or something, but that won't be the focus. But the experience is good. You can develop on GPUs. It gives you another tool you can use. So let's look at some of those. Okay. You guys hear me all right? Yeah. Yeah, we can hear. Okay. Um, so if we do 3D, let's look for 3D plot. So if, if you look at, a, let's say, a sphere, look at this. It's circular, but if, if we look at the least uh, lowest resolution one, it's a triangle. A triangle connected to a triangle and so on. It kind of looks like a sphere. Now you shrink the triangles, you add ton more of them, and you start seeing a smooth surface. So all the advancements, like from the PlayStation 1 or whatnot games that look very blocky, is essentially just because hardware <coughs> was very weak compared to now. So it could maybe draw only a few hundred uh, or a few thousand polygons um, a frame. So then all the characters, the world, the trees, buildings have a limit, like a budget of X amount of triangles that can be processed so fast. And so they have to limit it and then everything becomes blocky. Nowadays, we have all these crazy techniques, we have crazy fast CP, uh, GPUs, and then you can, on, a, on, on someone's face, you can have maybe more polygons than an entire game had on the PS1, uh, just because they are so fast. Now, and, and we see like this, we'll have to do it by hand, actually, in the beginning. So uh, if, you, if, if you want to draw a triangle, I think we have like that. In the GPU, we said that everything um, is vertices. So a vertex is just a point. So this, okay. Okay. so this is a vertex. Vertex is just a point, some coordinates, that's it. And this is a vertex, so I need to get my pen. So maybe we number them like vertex, uh, Vertex 0, vertex 1, vertex 2, right. And then we don't actually do the lines or, or like draw what's inside. All we give the, the GPU is coordinates of vertex. That's it, an array of vertices. That's it. So we tell the, the GPU like, hey, OK, if this is like 0, 0, this vertex is, I don't know, maybe let's say 0 on the x, 0 0.5 on the y-axis. So it's a bit up. This one is like 0 on, uh, sorry, 0 0.5 on the x, 0 on the y, right? And so, and the other one is one. And we just send these to the GPU. We tell it, hey, here are some vertices. Draw it. And then the GPU takes care of uh, displaying, putting the vertices on the correct position on the screen, because these are probably, for example, really coordinates, so it needs to be adjusted to be shown on a 2D screen. Uh, puts them. And then, uh, so the first step is, sorry, is a vertex, right? So vertex, uh, what we call a vertex shader, a shader is, by the way, just a program that runs on the GPU, nothing special. If someone says a shader, it just means they wrote code, but, but it runs on the GPU, on the CPU. So we have a vertex shader that kind of displays and decides on the positions of all the vertices, but doesn't draw any pixels, just puts the positions. And it goes, I think then there's a compute shader that won't do all the shaders, but the most common one is this. In the end, it ends up to 
what we call a fragment fragment shader. So these vertices, uh, there is like uh, compute, geometry shaders, whatnot, and then the GPU decides, okay, here are the lines connecting them. And even on my screen, I think, I'm not sure if you can see, but there are these boxes. So this is very good representation actually of uh, of the pixels. So imagine these are pixels. So you can see how the line is intersecting the pixels, sometimes partially, sometimes fully. And we are going to, uh, it's going to say, say we tell it to call it red. So it's going to do all these for each pixel. Like this is a pixel. This is a pixel. This is pixel so on. For each pixel or fragment, we call it, actually, we are going to run a shader. So imagine you have a function running for each single pixel. So it's going to run a few million times, maybe for the entire screen or more. Uh, and each fragment shader outputs a uh, outputs a color. That's the output of the fragment shader. That makes sense. Does that make sense? No, sorry, I'm I'm muted and I'm watching like the stream in full screen, <laughs> so I have to like no leave the the uh, full screen and have to unmute myself and then come back. But yeah, I think it makes sense so far. Yeah, so so the vertex shader decides on the points and then the fragment shader decides on the colors uh, of each pixel and whatever the output is, it ends up being set. And this is kind of the general. And we'll go through each stage when we develop it. This is kind of the general uh, structure steps called the pipeline steps. They have these series of things that happen on the GPU. So the job, our job on the CPU end, uh, is to send this information to the GPU. Uh, that's why you have GPU RAM, right? To hold the list of vertices, to hold the um, the shader programs that actually are executed on the GPU, and all of that. Uh, or any other data variables that you make, data structures on the GPU. So that has to start on the CPU, get sent to the GPU. And then from there, uh, the GPU can execute every frame. And then we tell it, we tell the GPU, for example, okay, so draw this shape, use the shader on this set of vertices, etc. cetera. Uh, now, this interaction, and this is kind of the next piece, this interaction that happens between GPU, CPU, or usually CPU to GPU, is by some kind of API, right, application program interface, like OpenGL. So you have all of these things, like OpenGL, which is, I guess, what we will use. It's cross-platform, it's very popular, uh, available on mobile phones, on the web. WebGL is essentially OpenGL for the web. Uh, so you have OpenGL, you have DirectX on Xbox and uh, Windows, and you have Vulkan, which is kind of a successor to OpenGL, but not very high adoption yet. I think. And you have Metal, uh, which Apple released sometime. All of these are essentially a spec, an API more or less. And the spec defines the set of functions available on the GPU. Right? Um, so especially on OpenGL, this is what like I know more, so focus on that. You don't actually like the company or the organization, I think Kronos, it's called Kronos now, um, developing the spec does not implement sexy plus plus. It only defines the functions available, you know, what they do in the inputs and what the outputs. The implementation is done by the graphics provider, so that would be done, so maybe NVIDIA, AMD, Intel, whatnot. NVIDIA is going to have one implementation for the same OpenGL version. AMD is a separate implementation. Maybe like, like implementation, I mean, how it, it works under the hood. So maybe NVIDIA is a bit faster or whatnot, but in general, they operate the same way. So we write the code once, gets into the, uh, we talk to the GPU through this interface, through OpenGL or whatnot, 
and that gets executed depending on the graphics driver. This is what people mean by graphics. The graphics driver is essentially uh, the version, the, the code, the implementation of these, all these specs. So your, your GPU probably supports all of these, or most of these, like OpenGL, at least DirectX, well, cannot. It supports these, and you can use anyone with it. That's why in, in some games, you can change. You can tell, okay, use the OpenGL implementation, use the Vulkan implementation, and that's X, and sometimes one is faster than the other just because of optimizations uh, that happen under the hood. Sick. So, um, so the the first thing we'll have to do is kind of get access to OpenGL to start doing all of this. Or actually, just before that. So there are two related potentially, but separate things. We have the way of running the uh, the window. So how do I tell the operating system, give me a window, make it this size? Um, any input events I'm going to get from the operating system. These things are not graphics, but are required for us to get a place to run our graphics. So our graphics have to run within a window. And this is not OpenGL's open uh, territory. I don't have to use OpenGL or a graphic. I can do software rendering. I can do let the CPU and rendering within the, uh, within the window. So we're going to need two components. We're going to need two things. One is, so we have the OS. We need a layer on top to handle window, right? And um, so this is uh, windowing, inputs, what? So this is on top of the OS. We need on top of the GPU, we need the spec or something that is like OpenGL. So yeah, get the pen, get it. Now, this is handled by a different library. So there are uh, several libraries that have cross-platform uh, implementations of the different OSs. So you can, you can just say, create a window for me, make it this size, put it in this position, and it will work no matter the OS. Um, and then, OpenGL handles what happens within that window, if that makes sense. And so uh, there are several libraries. So you have one called SDL, uh, SFML. Uh, so this uh, SDL is actually very popular. It's very low level. Written in C, it's very old as well, very well known, and it's used to make a lot of games. I think even uh, CSGO Valve uses it a lot, Team Fortress 2, so it's the L2 games. Uh, let's see. let's see. So these are old games, even Amnesia, uh, Dwarf Fortress or you're interesting, Half-Life 2, right? Team Fortress 2, Counter-Strike Global Offensive. So all these games have been done with SEL. It's an abstraction layer on top. SFML is similar, but it's more high level. Now, you can use SDL to do a lot or most of your graphics without interacting directly with OpenGL. But in this case, since we also want to learn more about the intricacies of, uh, of a GPU, um, we want to directly, we don't want, we only want to use SDL for basic inputs and to get us the window and whatnot. Beyond that, we will do everything manually directly with the GPU. So we are going to use SDL for windowing and inputs, maybe some stuff with audio and whatnot, and then we're going to use <coughs> OpenGL for that. Does that make sense? You guys have questions? 
it's a bit it's a bit a lot of information to take in for the first time, but I think um can you go back to the diagram? Yeah. So we've okay. got this and yeah. So we talked about the sorry. The vertices the vertex fragment, and we'll look into each one in detail, but I just want to kind of put out the very high level stuff. Uh, yeah. The specs, the GPU uh, APIs, and then what we will need. We'll need something to handle window, like to interact with the OS, and something to interact with the GPU. So interacting with the GPU is OpenGL, interacting with the OS is going to be, um, <clears throat> you know, the uh, SDL for us in this case. And we'll use Goland as a programmer. I think it's just nicer, more modern C. So it will be very basic, no crazy things like C++, but, you know, and it's all templates and all the crazy features. Um, so I hope it's, it will be understandable for most people. We look into each single part of what I'm saying. Do you have any questions on this, please? Okay, cool. Right. Um, so the start for us, right, we said we need the window first. So we are going to start not with OpenGL, with SDL first. And if I just, let's look at SDL. Which is SDL2, simple direct media layer. Very, very popular. And, <clears throat> well, even Dark2. There you go. Um, I think it's completely free and open source. Now, what we want is we want SDL Golang. There is this very nice uh, project. I think it's this one. That's what I'm using. So the first step is we're going to need to set up SDL. Uh, now, a bunch of what we'll do, including the OpenGL stuff, we're going to need the. Um, a C, C++ compiler, because now Go can work with C, but if you have C stuff in Go, you are going to need a compiler, a C compiler that Go can use to compile the C stuff. So here's documented very well, um, and this is you know well maintained and updated libraries. So we're going to use this. So if we look at the requirements for me, I already have it installed, but this is the Beyond Go, Go SDL2, top search result. We're going to need to install it. So SDL has kind of different DLLs, different components that can be used, um, including stuff to help you with sound, you know, phones, um, image loading. So if you want to load like a PNG into your game, whatnot, and the fundamental SDL library. Uh, for me to be safe, I don't know what to use in the future. I got all of them already, but even SDL for now is fine. So they have instructions for everything. <laughs> it's very easy. The most complicated one is Windows because it does not come with a compiler, a C compiler. Uh, but thankfully, it's not too hard. You need to download, if you're following on Windows, you need to download the MingW uh, compiler. That can just go. Downloads uh, and get it for Windows. That should be it for you, Sigwin, if you have Sigwin. So we'll get that, and then we'll download SDL and extract it into into the wherever you installed the MingW compiler. That's there really is it much after that. Then you just put that bin in your environment. Uh, that's enough. now when you get the zip file, you're also getting a DLL, and this is what I essentially have here. So you can see I have a lot of DLLs. The main one is SDL2.dll. So whatever DLLs uh, you get along with that, after following these steps, we're putting the DLL next to in the same folder as my Go program. So this is just a folder. I have only main.go. Uh, 
and next to it I put all these DLLs. So yeah, you can follow this. I already did. I'm going to do that. And then once we have installed SDL, like the C stuff, essentially, we can install the Golang library. It's very straightforward. Just I use this one for me. I have sequence or go get, or you can just do individually go get all of these and word. Uh, if you have done this, then just have this Go program, you should be able to print line hello go on. So seems to be working fine. fine. Uh, so that's that's all for SDL. Now the now it comes the interesting part is let's use SDL to do our window and and they have a very nice example, so we're going to kind of follow that and show how easy it is. The nice thing about SDL is it's cross-platform. So whatever we do is going to work on Linux, Mac. They, they even support mobile for sale. It's very good. So we're going to first, I'm going to import SDL. So the same, same one. And the first thing we need to do is to init it completely. And I think we'll do in everything. So because it has multiple components, so maybe you have a, a graphics component, a sound component, maybe you don't need everything. For us, we don't care. Just say, okay, give me everything. And get an error, and if error, uh, we can panic. I say fail to init. Now that SDL is initted, we can ask SDL create a window form to just a normal GUI window on any OS. So let's say SDL create window. You can get title. So uh, go SDL engine. It needs the position in the string. So for now, I'm going to uh, let's see, just zero that. Width and height. And I think we can give it flags to center it, yeah. So for now, let's, let's I'll make some variables. Costs. So when window width, let's do it uh, just an HD. 1 to 70, I think. And 1 high. So it's uh, 1 to 80. Okay. 1 to 80 by 720. Now, where do I want to start? SDL has stuff for center window position centered. And I can just put the put this for X and Y position. So this is the top left I think this is the top left center of the screen. Let's see. Yeah I think it's the top left. So zero zero would put it on the top left of your of your screen. We will test that. Um, and then when width and when height and then flags. So flags tell it like what type of window is this? Uh, maybe you want to start it with some different specific configuration. Like I want to do it start full screen. So again, all of this is an SDL. So SDL dot. Uh, you just have window. We'll take the docs. So this is one of the things I want to show. is just normal programming. So we look at the docs at the time. So window underscore, underscore shown. So it's just normal. We don't want many ones. So we say window underscore shown. There we go. Uh, now let's run and see. Yeah, right. Oh, there we go. It showed and went away. So I'm going to uh, do a while loop for loop infinite. Infinite loop, and we are just going to find dot sleep, or we can use the SPL function as well delay. So we're going to sleep for 
so I said like 16.6 milliseconds is if you want to run at 60 FPS. Right. So I'm going to just delay uh, by this amount, to 17 milliseconds, just to keep it strong. There we go. So we have a window. We have the title. It's very nice. But now we get to the interesting part, which is uh, the, you see, it's not responding. I cannot move it. Well, now I can, okay? And you cannot resize it. So you see, it just shows the loading screen, a loading icon for me. Um, I can't, yeah, okay, crash completely. Um, and this, to me, is one of the most interesting things because uh, you have to do everything. This is going to be very different from other things that people are used to. You have to do every single thing. Like, the window won't even close, it won't resize. Um, if it clicks, you are not going to be told, oh, so someone clicked. You have to handle the click. So we are very low level. We are just above the OS. Uh, using SDL. So let's just handle this. So it's going to give us back a window and an error. So I want to keep the window, so window. Um, uh, that's an SDL pointer to our SDL window. So window and an error. And if error, then panic. I, I'm I just made the only thing I made extra is this logging package where I defined info warning and error loggers from Golang and I, it just prefixes uh, with this message and shows the line of the file I made it. So I'm going to use those instead. And say logging dot, um, in this case, it's an error log, fatal, fatal line. Built to init SDL and error is here. No beginning, no. The line failed to create error. All right. Um, <clears throat> so if we look at the docs now, by the way, I hope this is. Yeah, right, I'm not going too fast. Please ask me if I uh, should explain. It's all good? No, I, I think it's a good speed. OK. I think it's a good speed. Yeah. All right. So uh, of course, we're going to need to remember to destroy the windows. Like, yeah, if, once the program shuts down, it's already destroyed. But good practice. Let's do that. I'll, I'll, I'll come back to the I have, have a question. Yeah. yeah. So when you, can you go back to the code, back yeah. to your code? Yeah. Um, you created the window, but and then what, like what happened? What does it, like, what does it, uh, a delay do? Does oh, delay. It... Yeah, so I yeah. can run a normal loop here, because if I don't put the loop, it's going to shut down, right? Like if I remove the loop and I run, uh, I am going to just program opens and closes immediately. Right. Yeah, so, like what happens if you just keep a loop without a delay? You can, now you're running at as fast as your CPU can take it. You're just burning your CPU. Uh, so I don't want to do that. I don't want to use all my CPU time running an infinite loop like this, an empty infinite loop. Right. So I want to limit it. So uh, if you, uh, if we look, if we bring a calculator, we use this a lot. In one second, sorry, if I am running 60 frames per second, so a single frame of that is how many seconds? So I can divide one, it's not the best calculator, but yeah, uh, one divided by 60, uh, this many seconds, if I convert to milliseconds, multiply by 1,000. So if I want to run at 60 frames per second, a single frame, and, and we'll talk about the concept of frames exactly, like what it actually means and, and why, you know, we care about it in games but not in other things. But a single frame is going to uh, take 16.6 .6 milliseconds. 
So if I take more, like let's say if I take one second to do a frame, then I have one frames per second, super lag. If I take one millisecond to do a frame, then I can do a thousand frames a second, right? I'm running extremely fast. Uh, so we want to limit it. So you say, okay, you know, we want to limit it to 16. Uh, so if my CPU is faster than this, it's just going to waste the time sleeping. It's not going to do anything. So in this case, I'm just going to SDL delay. And I say, hey, loop, process this, and then sleep for like 17 or 16 milliseconds so that I never go above this much. So I don't need to burn my CPU time running nothing, doing nothing. This will be different later. We'll look at timing. Timing is one of the important things as well uh, for games. So that's going to be interesting. Mm -hmm. So now it remains open because I have anything to do, but I cannot do anything. I can drag it, it's completely and can't even close it, crash. Or Windows thinks it crashes uh, just because we're not handling it. So for inputs, so let's just first uh, continue into that, into this thing. So then they do this thing called a surface. We look at we won't actually use it in the end, but you know. Uh, Surface and then you know they update on blah 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 and then they do some that's fine. So let's do something ourselves. Um let's first just talk about discipline. So I, I think you hear about the word textures, right? You have a you have a texture. It's called a texture. What's texture in games and like, oh, I have high quality textures and whatnot. So a texture is just an image. Image with colored pixels inside, that's it. Now you can imagine the window. So the, the space, if this is not a texture, let's say this is my window. Sorry, I'm really bad at drawing. This is my X button, right, so whatnot. My, sort of, this is my window. And all the space within it, these are all pixels that I can use. And this is where it gets interesting because now, if I have control over every single pixel on the screen, I can do simulations or automata, I can draw stuff and whatnot. Uh, so we need a way of talking about these pixels. So we want to be able to Tell the program, tell Windows, or tell the GPU, hey, this pixel, this specific pixel coordinate, please set it to this color. So for SDL, this is going to be different for OpenGL, and every sim, everyone does it differently, but for SDL, the window, no matter the actual size and the number of pixels, it marks it normalized. So it's, it's like 0, 0, top left, and one one bottom right always no matter the size right it's like a percentage so if i put so so when you go down y increases the y value goes up when i go to the right x increases so the the x value goes up so that means if i want to get the pixel in the exact center of the screen I am going to go 0.5 to the right, 0.5 down, because it's not like the normal x-axis where y, uh, y up is positive here, it's going like this. So y down is, pos uh, is positive. So we're going to go 0.5x, 0.5y, and I'm going to get exactly the center. So the center of the screen is 0.5. 0.5 on the x, 0.5. So we want a way to, to be able to tell, to get an array, essentially, of all the pixels on the screen. And the pixels are indexed by their position. Right? So I want to say pixel uh, number 10, 10, or whatever, right? Set it to color red. And we want to be able to have this control. Now there is no GPU or just our CPU is telling the screen or Windows something. Make it this good. Now we can, to do this, we can 
access, and I hope the code is readable, by the way. Let me check this stream too. Should I zoom in more, or is this good? Um, for me, it's good. Um, I'm on full screen. OK. So, so it could be a bit too small if you're not watching in full screen. Mm. Yeah, I, I get what you mean. I think this is OK. Someone has a hard time with Zoom. OK, because the lines can get a bit long. Read space. Okay. So we have the window. Let's just explore kind of what's inside. So we have a bunch of GL. So usually GL, like open GL stuff is GL GL. Uh, now we just want to see, OK, uh, get title. We can do set title, set position, so we can move it around. Let's see, what else do we have? Uh, we have show, minimize, maximize, full screen, all of that. Icons, we have full control already, very little amount of code. Even something as simple as this, for some reason, is nowhere today. Like nowadays, no one talks about things like this, that you can just get a window and do it. Everyone's using these huge libraries, it's just very weird. So I hope this kind of enlightens someone. All right, so we want to get, you search for pixel, you can only get the format, we talk about format later, but uh, want where do I draw? Where do I put the color? So we we need to get something. Um, so we can get a render, which we'll do later. But we can also get surface for now. That's the simplest, fastest thing. So the surface is essentially this place. It's the thing within the window where things are actually drawn. So uh, we're going to get from that window its own surface, mm -hmm. which is an abstraction by SDL. So I get surf, error, I'll title the error for now. Let's look at the surface. What does it have? So it has width and height, very nice. A bunch of things. Mm -hmm. Now we can get, oh, there are pixels. So now we are starting to actually, uh, we can get a number of pixels. We can get an array of all the pixels. Very nice. Uh, and then we can actually start playing with this. If we look at this one, let's see. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, correct, it's fine. And I want to do per pixel. So let's make our model data duplicate. Do also a rect. So rect is just a rectangle. New right. It has a, a top left position, x and y. And then from that position on the top left, a width and a height. So this is how you make a rectangle. And this will use a ton, this kind of uh, thing. And we have format. So let me just talk about the format a bit because we need it now. In in your arrays, in your GPU window, anything, you you have let's say per pixel, we have R G B A. Now usually these are a byte each, so one byte for the R, one byte for the G, uh, G B and A. A is alpha. We can talk about this later. It's like transparency. So if I have zero zero zero, that gives me black. If I put, since it's one byte, it can handle values from 0 to 255. So if I put 2, 5, 5, 0, 0, that's red. Now, the the format is the ordering. If I have an array, right, which has all the pixels, just an array, and this is an array of bytes, let's say we're dealing with just with RGB for now. I can position them such that there is R, G, B, R, G. So it becomes that this is pixel, right? 
pixel 1 and this is pixel 2 so each pixel takes multiple positions in the array and the format of the pixel this will matter in, in reading we have to define it on the window so on when if we deal with like uh, individual pixels we have to know the ordering because it might not be RGB maybe I'm doing like little Indian big Indian depending on the thing this maybe is or this is potentially this is potentially for example one uh, I can do it completely reverse BGR which one so I have to know that the first byte of this pixel is actually not right it's just blue and the second byte is green the second byte is red if I don't know this, then I won't be able to write the values that I want. My function might just receive RGB all the time, but I have to decide or I have to know what is the output format, um, especially since we are dealing directly with this. And this is why in the surface, we have a format and gives us back a pixel format. Um, and then has mass and whatnot. Mm -hmm. OK, now let's just go with this and then we reach there. So, we have the surface, the place, and then within the surface, we just want to, um, we will put like an, a rectangle. First, let's fill it. So I want to fill the whole thing. See, this is an integer. It's very interesting. We'll talk about it. I have the surface, the place inside the window. I want to set it to a certain color, all of it, for now. What is the color? You can see that the color is an integer, unsigned in 32. But we just said that, hey, this is, this doesn't make sense, right? We have, we need three or four. If it's RGBA, we need four values. But the thing is, it's, um, it's what you call packed. So eight by, uh, eight bits, right? eight bits, eight bits, eight bits. If you have alpha, eight bits, all of these take up. 32 bits. That means one integer within it can have um, an entire color. So I don't have to specify separate values. So to do this, um, you can imagine. Now um, we have so so maybe we have red. So maybe this is the order. Let's say the order is red, green, red, green blue and alpha, alpha again, transparency. Uh, so red has, only needs eight bits. So potentially the top eight bits of my integer, I have one integer. The top eight bits, like maybe zero, 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 one, one, one. And then this is all one number in our mind. Here's zero, maybe the rest is all zeros. And so on, so on, so on. Right? These eight bits of my integer represent green. These eight bits represent red, and so on. You can see that there's nothing signifying, hey, these ones are for red, these ones are for green. That's why the format matters. The format might say, no, actually, this is red. This is green. We don't, right? That's, that's something you can specify. But all of them is what we call packed into this. Now, luckily, we don't have to do it by hand. SDL has some functions to help us. So we can do sdl.color. There's the color. There you go. That's the struct for color. And the color has just RGBA values. So I'm going to just, so let's say we want the whole screen red, maximum red. And then uh, G is 0, B is 0, alpha, I think it needs to be full. Um, and that's it. Now, I want you enter. So it's going to pack them and give me this number. Right. And we're going to fill the right with. So I, I got a, a surface, and I'm going to fill the whole surface with a single color with RGB. Now, if there is a mismatch between in the ordering, we're going to get different colors. 
which is what we find out now if we you see if it matches or not. Now we just need to update. So we, we drew, uh, but it won't show up on the screen yet. So we need to update the surface. So we tell the surface, hey, any changes that have been made to you should represent it outside. So we say, uh, now window, update surface. Let's run and see what we get. It's blue. Okay. It's full blue. So that tells us that. Uh, Close. This tells us, so here it says that the format is RGBA, but we put R as full, we got blue. That means the, the B is in the beginning. Right, so, so it's actually, in this case, it's think BGRA or, or completely reversed, ABGRA. Uh, <clears throat> Wait, what happened? <laughs> Uh, this part? Yeah, like, like if it says RGBA, why is blue in the beginning? Right, yeah. And this is kind of the formatting I was talking about here. It's an integer with each eight bits represent within that integer representing one of the colors. Which, like, the first eight bits, what do they represent? Is it red or green or blue? Who decides? What decides is yeah. the pixel format. And this is, so let's check what is the pixel format of the screen. Let's do, uh, or, or just use the surface line. Uh, format. Um, so let's do, can I get just the whole thing? Yeah, I want it. perfect. So, okay, let's just print the, let's get all the values. No gain in follow paradigms. So let's see the format of the screen. Okay. So if we look at this, um, there is a mask. Okay, I want bits actually. Ah, there we go. Shifts. So we have shifts. I want something central to show. Uh, let's also log the SDL dot A B B R it's bits of one. So the format, it says, I, I forgot how to do binary. I think printf can show you binary, I think. But the formats, so SDL has several formats uh, built in that we can specify. So pixel format, um, ABGR, let's see. Yeah, OK, this is nice. Get pixel format name, let's use that. So we put the format, and we'll get the name. What's the format? U int. This is U int. There we go. So it's using RGB eight eight eight. So it seems there is no alpha. RGB. Uh, yeah. So the SDL I think has like it flips the NDNS. So if you see RGB. It actually means the opposite. So it means BGR uh, because of how SEL treats it. Now the eight is how many bits is each component. So um, what HDR means, high dynamic range, usually means we are giving more memory to a single pixel. So a single pixel might be more, uh, right, like a higher value, maybe not eight bits, maybe 16 bits per component of a pixel. So uh, this means the first thing, so 
uh, where is this? The normal SDL color gives us RGB, RGBA, while the surface is working with BGR. So that means uh, RGB. So if I set red, it's going to give me blue. Uh, green should work fine. So let's set green and on. And then uh, B is actually, and, you, and we can change these things. Like you can play with the format. Okay, yeah, we don't have alpha, it does not support alpha. This one. Let's see actually if we can. We don't have to use to surface, right? We'll, we'll throw it away, but it's, it's nice to play with. Let's convert format. Okay, there we go. Nice. So we'll say convert format. Uh, so copies surface into another surface of the specified format. Uh, This is not going to be efficient, but let's do this. Set. Uh, let's say we want pixel format ABGR 888. So, so it's all reverse. So it's RGBA. It's essentially RGBA. Uh, I don't think flags want. So surface so we get the new surface with the proper format that we want um, we're going to fill sorry we're going to fill this new surface with the color that we want so now it should work correctly because it's, it's in the same format this thing is that's the correct format but it's not um, if I update surface, the window is using which surface? It's using this one. So I'm going to copy again. I'm going. I'm going to copy my surface to the original surface and then show the screen. So I'm going to say the new surface. Let's um, convert. Can we convert directly? That'd be nice. Into a new one that is optimized. Uh, we want to. Sorry, I want to use the surface. So it's part of the point is to see how to do this. So sets. Let's look at surface maps. Update service. So let's look at this one. Uh, yeah, or you can set the, the color directly. You can do that for now. Yeah. Let's keep to that for now. So, so okay. what you want to do is essentially is have like on the window, say window that sets surface and assign that to the one that you just created, right? Yeah. So we, we can look into that, but I don't want to spend too much time on this. On to, because when we do OpenGL, this won't matter. We'll do our own things. Um, but since we know now, like from the from here, that our surface got this RGB888, we can then uh, fill the surface, which is fill. So fill. It. I, I won't say a specific right, so it's going to fill the whole thing and then give a color. So we know the format, that means we can give the byte. So, so the it's like the 0x, uh, it's what BGR, right? BGR. So it's two representing blue, green, right. So maybe I want it right, right? So I'm going to say zero for B, two zeros again for, for G, and then FF for R. So this is hexadecimal for R. So no. Uh, and it's going to fill it. Oh, we don't need this anymore. So get the surface, fill it with red, and it's red. So now this should show us. Go on. Blue. 
Okay, so maybe it's not actually reverse. Uh, blue, okay, maybe it's RGB. So actually the color function is what was found on the format. So actually, that means it's RR uh, GGBB. So let's do the bytes ourselves. Yeah, that's correct. Okay. So the format that we got out of the function is actually the correct order. R and then G and B, and each one has eight bits. And that's what we are doing here, right? We set full red, zero green, zero blue. Uh, that's it. Yeah. Uh, we can mix. So we say maybe <coughs> AA for so red and blue as we want to mix the colors. And, and if we keep changing that, right, it's going to animate. So this is kind of a start. Um, we can, you can imagine objects within the screen as a drawing saying, okay, only this rectangle in this specific position, like if I want to draw like a Mario game. So one specific position is going to be uh, one box, right, with the, with the image inside with specific colors inside, and then another position is going to be something else. So you're going to have different tracks. But we'll do this with vertices directly, but you can imagine different tracks within the same surface, giving you all the objects or all the things within your game, trees and just by filling. Uh, but instead of direct colors, we're going to like use textures. All right. So we have window. Let's do a bit of, um, let me just handle this here. to painting. And then I'm going to just update the window. Right. Now um, let's let's look at a bit of input. So if you run this now, <laughs> it just doesn't do anything. It's hangs, it's closed, it's doing. That's because we're not handling events. Input. So uh, this is kind of a bit hard actually. Use it. So, how events happen, how inputs happen on the OS, any OS, is you have your window or your program. Right, your program is running. And you have the OS. And you have your your keyboard. When you click, your keyboard is going to notify the OS, and your OS is going to potentially send an event telling your program there is a keyboard event that happened. Your program is free to do with it what it wants, but it must handle it. You cannot ignore events. If you ignore, like it's like a queue, it's going to pile up. And the OS is just like, okay, this program, I have sent it many events. People have clicked the mouse. They have, you know, used the keyboard. We told it to quit. It's not doing anything. It's not responding. It's not saying, hey, I finished the event. And therefore, the OS is going to consider the program has crashed. And this is why our program, even for running fully normally, is considered by Windows that the program crashed. Um, so what we need to do is, while the OS is, is buffering, is collecting these events, be it mouse or something else, we are going to poll, we're going to ask the OS. We're going to check, hey, give me event X, give me event Y. You don't have to handle all the events, there are like a billion of them. But we can say, tell me if there is a keyboard event. Maybe you want a mouse event. Like, was the mouse moved? How much was it moved? Was it clicked? Which button was clicked, etc. Once you start handling those, the, uh, the OS is not going to care. It's going, OK, the program is doing normally. So we're going to build. And this has to happen all the time, right? You cannot do it once. This is why we need an infinite loop. And this is actually called, it will become more clear with time why, but this is called game loop. So why isn't it called game? 
this is where the frames happen. So it will become a very clear snipe. But for now, our game loop is going to do one thing. Um, handle input events. I'm just going to separate this into functions. So it's not clutter. Uh, handle inputs. And every tick, we're going to handle inputs. And when we handle inputs, we are going to just check with the OS, like, hey, is there anything that has happened? And at the very least, even if we don't do anything, at least we, the OS knows that we are alive and we are reacting to changes, even if we want to ignore them. So we're going to use this code from the SDL, right? So SDL, luckily, um, has the connection with OS, how it gets it from Maxon, does the OS calls for us. And we can run a loop like this to check what are the events that have happened. So you say, it's a normal for loop. There's this function we use called poll events. There is an event, whatever the kind, for us to handle. It's going to return an event. Um, otherwise, it returns null. So when it returns null, we say, OK, for now, that means for now, we have processed all the events, and so we don't need to do anything. So we're going to get the event. We're going to parse it. So we say e equals this. So this is a switch case. We're going to cast the event to some specific type. And um, there is something called like a quit quit event. So when someone clicks the why is the X button not working? Because no one is we're not handling when when it's pressed, the OS is going to send us a quit event. It's our job to handle the quit, quit event. If we don't, the OS is going to consider okay, this pro program probably crashed. So I'm just going to make a variable on the top. All is running the boolean initialize to true and while it's running we'll keep the the window of the program running when as soon as this exits we're going to exit so in here we're just going to say is running equals false so again we're not forced to but we decide that hey I want to uh, we want to handle this. Uh, and start. Okay, just okay. So, so yeah. So we're going to every frame, every tick. We're going to check for all events. And right now, everything else we're ignoring. It doesn't matter as long as we are handling them. Like we're taking them from the OS, it's going to be fine. But for now, we are handling one type, which is quit, and then we run for. So now let's see. So we're handling. The window is movable now, but my mouse doesn't show it's loading. Right? I can click. I can move it around. I can't resize, but I can move. And if I click X, it goes this way. No errors. If I force close it, I get some error. But now it's all, all good. Right. Uh, so I think this is very good progress. And this is all because now that we are handling it, because Windows is handling the movement for us in this case, but it needs to know that we reacted to it. We know that it happened. Maybe you know some programs won't let you move them or something. Um, or when you click the X button, you want to show a window saying, are you sure you want to exit? Things like this. To do this, Windows doesn't take action until we have processed the events. So here we are processing them. You can see it's running. Now, we want to start that we have we have a basic window, right? We have some place to draw. We'll, we'll make it much nicer later on. Maybe next session we'll do like pixel stuff. Well, now let's handle inputs. Let's see that we can detect a key is pressed. So there is another type of input called conveniently SDL dot keyboard event. And that just means something happened with the keyboard. The button was clicked, was lifted, maybe it's held down, so it's a repeat, right? and so on. Um, so I'm going to say E equals, and in here for now, it's just print E dots. So we have, in the keyboard event, what do we have? We have key symbol. So like, what's the code of the key? Uh, repeat, is it a repeat or not? 
if it's good, if if it if it's just the first click, it's going to be zero. If it's repeating, it's going to tell us, um, you know, it's it's going to be bigger than zero. State. So if we look at state, uh, and we can check the docs for this, but the state is either sdl dot rest or sdl dot read. So we can know is it press or these, and so on. we have the type. Uh, we have window ID and a bunch of things. So let's log the key symbol dot symbol. It's just an integer, so let's it for now. And then let's log the E dot state. Is it equal to SDL press? Okay, press. So this will give us two. Uh, so let's run. So I'm going to press A. So code 97, which is correct for small a. So this is the, the symbols number. And then was it pressed or not? So you can see we've got two key events in this case. I pressed it once, but I, we got two. One is when I pressed it, and we got another event when I lifted my hand. So on the state change, it's uh, it gave us another event. So we can react to it. If I hold it now, we can see through and then just through, 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 through because I'm repeating. Now, as soon as I let go, we're going to get one fault for the same. If I press another key like S, that's code 115. Does this make sense how this is working? I think it's, uh, it's interesting. We never have to deal with these things. Yeah, I think in, on the browser, you get one event. Or, I mean, in the browser, you can choose to to ignore. So maybe we don't see it, but... Yeah. Yeah. The browser probably under the hood handles that and just forwards to you the ones that you want to see. But you don't have no. to have a continuous loop. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. This also honestly shows like just how fast computers are. Because in normal thing, we think these things don't happen. While in reality, there is something constantly running and checking and... And there will be more and more and more. You will be amazed at how many things are running every frame. That sometimes doesn't do anything, or just like you know, keeping up to date with with, the, with what's happening. And again, it's very nice. You can move it, click. Uh, so I think very cool thing to have now is to build an input system. So we want to have like a small library, a package within this. So this is one of the things we talked about for game engine. We have to have to handle inputs. So I don't know, maybe when we, you know, click a button and we change the color or we move the character or something. Uh, so we need to handle keyboard inputs for sure. This will give us, you know, keyboard access and we need to handle similarly mouse inputs. So we have mouse motion. We want to know the mouse move, mouse wheel, if it's got scroll or mouse button. So mouse button includes clicking the wheel, the two buttons and any other extra buttons. I'm going to do mouse button, and then similarly, it's a bit different. It's a, the type is a bit different, but you can see um, it has a button. If we look at this, it this is either all documented on SDL, so we can know. Uh, for some reason today, VS Code is not shown. Maybe message here, which is stupid, but we can see that. Um, Button is either button left, button middle, one of these. It's it's a byte, it's a uint, but SDL has these. So we can say, uh, you know, equals SDL dot button left. So it's just that const over an integer. Yeah. So is it left button, LB, is it left button? And then what else do we get? We get similar thing, which is the state, pressed or not. Is it, so is the state equal? Uh, we get clicks. So this is interesting, because uh, if we look at clicks, it tells us one for how many clicks like the user have been doing, you can actually go up, like it goes to eight, 10, whatever, how, how many you have been clicking. But at the very least, we know that it's going to be no less than one 
um, but if we double click it's going to be 2 so we can even know that whether the user double clicked or not so uh, maybe we can show number of clicks we can show uh, double click And that is simply isn't the number of clicks bigger than one. If it's bigger than one, that means we have to. So, let's see, uh, can we get SVL from symbol to character? I think not. Um, yeah. So let's let's see those. For an Okay, that's nothing. If I click my left button, left mouse button. Yep, so left mouse button is true. It's pressed once it's true, it's false. So, same behavior. One click and not double click. If I double click, we receive the first click normally, which is a true and false. But then, since I clicked fast enough, the next time we get another event, which is also true and false, pressed. But it says click two. Therefore, here we register that click this tool. Now the reason we made it bigger than one and not just like equal two is because I can click three, four, five. As long as I keep clicking, the clicks is going to keep increasing. So um, you might say uh, <clears throat> only if it's two, so you register it once. I think that's more accurate. Otherwise, you know, as long as someone is clicking, uh, you're going to consider that. So that depends also on the behavior that you want. Maybe every two and clicks, you want to double click. Uh, mm -hmm. Can you, like, for example, if someone double clicked, yeah, can you reset the counter? Like, if you want to prevent them from a double clicking um, 12 yeah. times. We can't reset the counter, but we can change our logic to handle it the way we want. So, for example, uh, in this case, let's say I the second click, I will consider it a double click, but anything beyond that, I'm not. Mm -hmm. So our logic then can then say, instead of considering a double click anything above one, it will only be equal to. So now, if I do this, and yeah, I yeah. keep clicking, right? Yeah. Yeah. It's only true once, and it's always false before now. So so it's about logic. And um, I think for this stream, we're near to two hours, so that's enough for today. But once we start implementing a full package for input, we are going to write the logic to use these events to give um, all the all kinds of inputs that we would want. Because think about it: in a game, there are so many things that different things that you, have, you want to um, know about. For example, if I'm shooting a pistol in like Call of Duty, I cannot hold the button and shoot. If I hold the button, it's going to shoot only one bullet. So a pistol normally only shoots when you first press down. It doesn't shoot as you hold it. But as you saw, uh, so you say, OK, you know, I'm going to, whenever I get it pressed, I'm going to um, shoot. But the issue is here then, OK, uh, what if I hold the button? I'm going to keep receiving events telling me it's press, it's press, press, right? The repeat function we talked about. So we want to only, for some things, we want to only handle it the first time. Some things we want to handle it when it's released the first time. And some things like movement, like if I press the W key, I want to keep moving forward even if it's just held down, so repeat. So there are many different cases that uh, maybe directly the, the event system does not notice. It only gives you click, release, and repeat. That's it. Is it repeating? We have to produce from these the other cases that are needed for a game. And we need to give kind of a, a way of um, querying that. So, <clears throat> so we'll, we'll essentially be abstracting, we'll make a new package. Called, I'll call it input. Oh, is it? Um, I mean to match our it's okay but okay inputs so inputs 
import.go and <clears throat> we're going to move uh, like the handling of events, whatnot, we are going to have all of this here. So we need a few public functions for this. Uh, in the game, people would want to know, for example, uh, key click. So is it was it just click this frame? And they need to send us some kind of key and we return a book. Right? We need to give that. Um, Actually, once I'll be back in a minute. Uh, just a minute. I don't need this one. What's Hey, you hear me? Yeah. Okay. So I want to create kind of the interface of what we will need from an input. So we, we need to know when a button is first clicked, but not if it's held. So it's like a, a, this is the first abstraction here we are going to get out of our game engine, essentially, is input. So is it just clicked? If it's held, I want false. But if it was clicked this frame, um, then I want to. Then we say be released. And just also now. Um, we want to say if a key is held down, if it's pressed. I don't care uh, if it's uh, this frame, is it a repeat, I don't care. As long as it's down, I'm going to do something. Like maybe you know, this for walking or shooting a rifle. And as well, try for automatic weapon and yeah. um, this kind of input. So we we'll say key down again for boolean, for example. Um, key up is the opposite. Is it just not pressed? And then I want to know if I'm not pressing it. Uh, let's see. And then, so key up, so these are all key. Now, for each one, we're going to need to know which key do you care about. Like, uh, are you searching for the A key, for which key is it? So we're going to get a key code, and we're going to use the SDL. So if we look at this, the symbol is an SDL key code. And an SDL key code is just, uh, what do you call it? Uh, if we go towards a key code, it's just an integer, I think. Yeah, this is an A32, essentially. That's OK. So we want people to send us an SDL key code uh, for each one. So you have to tell us, hey, what do you care about? What do you want? Right. 
Um, I think that's all for uh, keyboard, now for the mouse. Similar thing, but for the mouse. So mouse down. Or let's say mouse click first. And in this case, it's a mouse button. Uh, so what does this give us? Button left. Yeah, so it's just button left. So, we're, so this is just an end doesn't have a type. So I'm going to just say it's an int. Maybe we can use this here for this. So it's bool. Mouse. Mouse. Each mouse button. Then a bool. And uh, it's mouse down. Is is the button held down? Yes. Keyboard. Right. And the last one, this one now is mouse up. This one's click. Yeah. So this is the kind of interface. Um, so you know, to do this, actually, we need to hold some state. We cannot rely, I think, completely on the events, especially for some things like key clicked, key released, mouse clicked, mouse released. We need to remember <clears throat> what the previous frame was and what we have now, potentially. Uh, and that will give us, I think, more flexibility for the future. So let's add a function just to say, Handle keyboard event. So when a keyboard event, the, the main game loop is going to notify the input system that hey, uh, you know something happened. So it's going to say, so we're going to send this keyboard event, this one. <coughs> so sorry, event is this. No return. And similarly, we we need to handle the mouse. Yeah. Uh, yes. <clears throat> uh, mouse event is going to be a mouse button. Um, so let's see. So what do you want to do? Let's store. Let's see. so. We want to know if the key was clicked, and we want to know uh, what the state is and what was probability. So we need some kind of memory. I think since we are kind of looking up by the key code, I'm going to use a hash map. Uh, so let's do uh, key uh, key map. Let's make a new map and. It's a map of, so the input, the lookup is an SDL key code. And let's make a type, a struct. So we're going to, yeah, so let's see, that's the key state. It's just an internal state for now. Um, so the state is going to tell us, okay, what's the key code? Key to the SDL key code. Um, we want to handle some states of that. So this is implement one, one of them. So e dot. Oh. So when I get an event, we're going to, uh, oh sorry, here, the values are a pointer to key state. For us, missing variable type. It's a map of key code key state. So we have our map, we look up a key code, 
get the key state. So if we get something, so we say key state yes. We're going to look up in the key map using symbol symbol, right? Just as it's a key code. And now if it's now that just means we have never seen this key before, it's the first time. So we're going to fill it up. So we say s equals key state. And we're just for now I'm just putting the key. So e dot I'm putting the symbol to all the states. Um, and then let's put it in our map. Okay, so key equals s. This is kind of redundant if you get the events, but for completeness, let's keep it. Bytes. All right. Now, let's handle, let's remember other things. Like, we want to, for is clicked, we want to know if let's click this frame. Okay, Mohammed, see you. Thank you. Um, so we want to know if it was this frame, so we're going to say something like is pressed, is pressed now, uh, is pressed this frame. The name is a bit long, but use it for now. Is pressed this frame, the bool. We want to know if it was release this frame for the key release function. Is released this frame. Bool. Mm. Anything else for the keys? I think that's okay. Oh, uh, we need a state. Like, is it press or is it up? So the state is essentially the state. So SDL dot pressed. We have pressed and release, and these are just int. Okay, so we we'll make this an int. State. Going to do this. Uh, now we'll update this. So whenever we get an event saying that this uh, key was clicked, we want to update the state. We want to say, okay, before it was released, now it's pressed, or vice versa. Was it pressed this frame, whatnot? So the state we already get, like, is it pressed or released? We can update directly. So ks dot state is just the event dot state. All right. <clears throat> um, now we need to know: Is it press this frame or not? But this is a bit more tricky. There is more logic here. Um, so we can say: So it was press this frame if um, if it wasn't there, then it's definitely press this frame. So it must be. E dot state must be pressed. And uh, let's see what else do we have in repeat must be zero. And that's another thing that we, we absolutely need. P up, key down, same state. So yeah, so we need non zero if the key is a repeat. So if it's a repeat, it was not pressed this way. Or you know, same thing for up. So we're going to say if it's pressed this frame, that that must be state must be pressed, and the repeats must be zero. If these are valid, then it was pressed this frame. Um, otherwise, uh, we have released this frame. It's similar, but uh, it's released. So stl dot release. Now repeat is again zero because if I lift my hand of a key, then it's going to, uh, I think, it's going to repeat as up, or at least that's how we want it to work. So I want to know, I just lifted my hand, but if I, you know, left my hand, I want to uh, know about it. So this will change with the implementation, let's see. But for now, I think this is good enough. If I released it and we have no repeats, then uh, yeah, that's good. Okay. I think when you release, repeat is always a reset, so potentially you can remove this. Um, but it must be this frame. And anything else? Stay, timestamp. We'll test this to see 
and so on. And that's it. Uh, so now we are handling keys. If the key is new, the, the key symbol for the same key is never going to change, so you can set it and forget it. But the state is going to alternate, and whether it's press this frame or not. Uh, so let's just do keyboard events. So now to make this work, we're going to go to the keyboard event, and instead of doing anything with it here, we're going to send it to the input system dot handle keyboard event, and we're just going to send it in right here. Okay. Uh, similar thing for the mouse event, so I'm going to say input dot handle mouse event. It's not implemented, but you can just make it that way. Um, <clears throat> now, these become a bit easy here, because it's just looking up this. So is the key clicked? It's very easy. We just look up the map with the key code that we got. If we don't have it um, in the map, that means the key was never clicked before. And so it is by default up, so it's not clicked. It's already it's up. So we can just return for us. Key was never clicked. If we have the key, then we need to check if the is pressed, this frame is true. Okay. So we say if uh, we have it and we have pressed this frame, uh, then it's true. Otherwise, if this is false, then it's false. So we can just return this one. <coughs> And again, so let's look at the behavior of it. So, um, in our game loop, we're going to handle inputs. So this is one of the things about the game loop: is if you have the inputs, um, you you cannot do your logic before you get the inputs. So the game loop, usually even in game engines like Unity, you can see an order. Um, you have specific systems that run. In, in a specific order. So we have, let's say, inputs is usually one of the first. Potentially, then we'll update our game logic because it depends on the inputs. Once the game logic is run, maybe the game logic changes the positions of, of enemies or not, then our uh, our drawing functions would run. So we only draw to the graphics card to the screen at the end of the frame. So if we want to test this code, we have to put code after it. So this is the logic step for now, we'll just write here. And we can say uh, print line input dot e. uh, So we implemented key clicked on it, so let's just use that. So let's say we're testing for the A key. So SDL dot, um, you can find them with key underscore. So they have all the keys here, like this. The numbers K, like it's like keyboard underscore, then um, you have stuff like uh, the asterisk, ampersand, so you have special characters, you have copy, comma, down, and you have the, you know, all the F keys. C, some A, B, and C. If you just find A, K. A, it should be, what is it? This one said, okay, K and this one said, okay. A should be there, okay, it's there. Then it was showing me, I guess, what it's actually. Uh, so, if if it was just click this frame, this must return true. Um, <clears throat> otherwise, we need it to return. So let's test this behavior out. Okay, we crashed. So input line 40. Input line 40. That's right. It's not now. Oh, sorry. It is. It's not. If it's null, then it's false. If it's not null, then it's false. 
So it's false, that's correct. I'm not clicking. I click once. We have null pointer. Too many like null pointers. Okay, go 24. Um, are we sending null key events? Okay, it's fine. Again, flip the sum. It's null, it's null, yeah. Click, let's look. So even though I clicked once, we are running so fast that we we got through for a few frames. And then we went back to false. And if I hold, so the behavior should be if I hold, it would be uh, true for a bit, and then uh, goes back to false. If I hold, instead what we see, we see it does go back to false, but after a long while. The reason for this is actually uh, um, for the first one, when we press, even if I press really quick, it's going to take a while for me. It's going to be several frames before I lift my finger. So it's going to be registered as done. Um, and then for holding, you don't get a repeat immediately. So maybe if the computer is going to wait half a second, and then it's going to register it as a repeat. So it's, there's going to be a delay before the repeat counter goes up. Uh, we get this. Um, now, I think this is long enough. It's good to give this as a teaser for next time. I don't know if someone wants to try their hands at this. The, um, the code is all on GitHub. We're working on this. We're doing on the stream branch. The dev is a bit more ahead. Um, but everything else thing we're doing here. So I'm going to paste, or you can look at it. have these X2. GitHub. And then we photo. Um, you can use the this much. <laughs> um, you can follow. So, so this is, I'm going to push this. This is where we reach. So we're going to make some edits to this next time, finish up the input. And once we have the input system done, we can start playing with OpenGL. It's going to be very interesting. There is a lot to learn and cover in OpenGL, shaders, writing shaders, which is GLSL program language. So, thank you for coming. Uh, if anyone has questions, then I'll see you next time. I think we'll do it once a week, maybe next Sunday or Saturday, depending on your time zone, right?